Welcome to this talk. Today I will present you an approach proposed by Romain Vergne, Camille Nou, Joël Tolo, and myself, Nolan Mestre. We call this work Local Light Alignment for Multiscale Shape Depiction, and we will see how this method allows end users to better depict the shape of objects in 3D scenes. So let's begin. Understanding the shape of object is actually crucial in many domains, ranging from archaeology to topography, but also including scientific visualization, you could think of medical imaging in particular, and in the fields of entertainment such as the video game and movie industries. These domains all employ designers that are working with 3D scenes on a daily basis. They work at exploring these scenes, looking for unseen features, for instance. They also produce rendered images that are meant to be seen and understood by others. These designers and artists are in need for techniques allowing them to better convey the shape information. And this is actually our goal with this paper. We propose an approach to enhance shape depiction in rendered images. Here you can see how our method enhances the shield at multiple scales revealing both big features and the small details of the model. Of course, we are not the first ones to tackle this challenge and the computer graphics community has already done a lot of work in this field. Today I will focus on the three closest methods to our, and it begins with exaggerated shading. It was proposed in 2006 by Rosinkevich and colleagues, and it allows to enhance objects at multiple scales. It relies on a custom alpha version shading function, that solves masking effects. On the downside, being tied to this unique shading function, exaggerated shading can render only diffuse objects. In 2009, light warping, proposed by Vernian and colleagues, solved this issue by enabling the enhancement for arbitrary materials. Enhancements can be done at arbitrary scales, but not at multiple scales. Also, in some configurations, it can invert bright and dark patterns, which is of course something that you do not want. Later, Vang and colleagues introduced a novel method called radiant scaling. As with light warping, it enables the enhancement of arbitrary materials at arbitrary scales. What is actually new with this method is the ability to explicitly control the enhancement of shading components, allowing users to enhance highlights or refractions separately, for instance. <coughs> It still suffers from the lack of a multi-scale feature though. When used with extreme parameters, it can alter material appearance. As you can see in this example, the diffuse statue exhibits artifact specularity. Our approach, local light alignment, aims at combining all the strengths of these previous methods. We want to retain the multi-scale control from exaggerated shading, but still enabling the enhancement of arbitrary materials and the control of each shading component. The key idea behind our work is to locally move the light at each point of the surface, in a way that will maximize contrast between both sides of the features to be enhanced. If you look at this triangular prism here, as it is lit frontally, it is difficult to recover shape information. We would rather have something like that, that exhibits one bright side and one dark side. Our principle here is quite similar in essence to exaggerated shading, with a major difference though. We do not seek to place the light at a grazing angle, because indeed, if the detail is not protruding enough from the ground plane, it does not exhibit enough contrast in the end. To solve this, exaggerated shading is scaling the shading intensity, but it prevents them from using arbitrary materials. So we do things differently here. What we would like is something like that in all configurations. Before going any further, we need to understand why we can move the light around in the scene. And this is based on findings in the visual perception community. That state that our visual system is rather insensitive to lighting inconsistencies, up to a certain threshold, that is. So if you consider the mountains here, they are actually lit from two different uh, directions of light. Still, it's quite difficult to see that at first glance. Another key feature from our visual system is that it uses shading flows to recover shape information. 
Shading flows are directions and magnitudes of shading patterns in images. For the diffuse object here, you can see that as the color gradient that lies at the surface. For the specular one, you can see that as the compressions and stretchings of the reflected environment. That's how we recover the shape of these objects. All of that is great news for us, because it means that we can move the light in the scene without breaking its coherence. And it also means that, by moving the light, we can maybe better depict the shape of object if we manage to better align the shading flows with the shape flows, with the actual physical shape of the object. If I come back to my previous example with the diffuse ridge, when it's lit from above or frontally, it's difficult to perceive its shape. We would rather have what's on the right. And to achieve that, for each point, we will guide the light toward either the normal on one side, so that it becomes bright, and for the other points, the points on the other side, we will align the light with a tangent, so that the side becomes darker. All our computations are done locally, as I said, so let's say I want to enhance this feature here. That lies on what we call the base. The base is actually a smoother version of the surface. Well, we construct a local frame L, in which we will project all of our vectors, the light and the feature normal. It is constructed in a way that depends on both the feature and the base. Its z-axis is the base up vector, and its x-axis is the projection of the normal onto the base. Once constructed, we can project all our vectors in it and perform our rotation operation. You can notice here that we are aligning the light with the normal, and we need to discriminate between the cases where we should lighten the points and the cases where we should darken them. So how do we choose our guiding vector g? We simply look at the dot product here between L bar and x. L bar is the projection of the light onto the base, renormalized, so it looks a little bit like this. And we check the sign of the dot product between this projected light and x. If it's positive, it means that we are in this area here. If it's negative, it means that the light is coming from the other side of the feature. So what we are doing basically is just checking whether L and N are pointing in the same direction with respect to this local frame. If it's the case, we will brighten the point. If not, we will darken it. Of course, if we align the light with either the normal or the tangent, we will end up with binary shaded images, like so. It introduces a lot of discontinuities in the shading that we need to solve. To do that, we introduce a function, w, that is here to prevent the discontinuities to happen. I will not detail its formula here, but I can quickly display its graph. So it's a top half sigmoid function that looks a little bit like this, and that depends on the parameter lambda. Lambda is a confidence value between 0 and 1, that say whether we are close or not to a region that will introduce a discontinuity in the shading when we perform our rotation operation. So if lambda equals 0 or is near to 0, we should not rotate the light. But as soon as we deviate from 0, then we can start to enhance the shape. There is another parameter in this function, and it's gamma here. Gamma controls the slant of the function, and the closer to 1, the closer to a linear function. You can see that as a way to control the width of the area of transition between bright and dark regions. How quickly we go from the bright side to the dark side. We also introduce a user parameter sigma that controls the strength of the enhancement. It is what the artist will tweak to enhance the shape. Here you can see sigma varying in this video, from 0 to 1, its maximal value. At 0, there is no enhancement at all. And at 1, the, the enhancement is maximal, leading to what we call exaggeration. If you keep sigma to lower values, you end up with more plausible results. Now that we have seen how to enhance a single scale, we would like to enhance multiple scales at the same time, and we achieve that by creating a scale space first. 
we iteratively smooth the geometry of the model using an edge preserving filtering operation that gives us a set of S normals. We store these normals in gbuffers in practice. So here for S equals 5, we end up with 5 normal fields, from the finest here to the coarsest here. What I just showed you in the video was the result of the enhancement of scale 4 with the normal field 5 as the base. So we were performing our rotation operation here. Now we would like to enhance multiple scales, so we need to successively rotate the light direction along the pipeline. So that we end up with a final direction of light, L1, that takes into account all scales at the same time. To initialize this pipeline, we first use the original direction of light unchanged. It becomes our direction of light LS. LS is first rotated and we obtain the next direction of light, L4, that will be then used as the input of our next step of the pipeline. Here is the result of such an accumulation of enhancements. Here we enhance the coarsest scale, scale 4, with a sigma of 0.4. Here we enhance scale 3 with a sigma of 0.5, scale 2 with a sigma of 0.7, and the final scale, scale 1, with a sigma of 1. You can see how we tweak different scales independently using different values of sigma, allowing us to precisely control the enhancement. Here is the final rendering we obtain. Notice how the fine scales are enhanced and emphasized compared to coarse scales. Look specifically at the braids or the eye of the model. Still, coarse scales are a little bit enhanced. You can look at the torso here, for instance, or at the shoulder. We've seen how to enhance diffuse objects at multiple scales. We would like now to enhance objects with arbitrary materials. And to do that, we need to look at what is influencing the shading intensity. If I consider a mirror-like object, what is influencing the shading is actually the alignment between the light and the reflected view vector. But for transmissive materials, it's the alignment between the light and the refracted view vector. This gives us the intuition that we could change our guiding vectors in our computations and replace it with other vectors depending on the materials. For diffuse ones, we were using the normal because it's the dot product between the normal and the light that is responsible for the shading intensity. So what we simply do is replacing n with r in both the definition of the local frame and the guiding vector. Doing so allows us to enhance highlights or refractions easily. Now let's sum up what we've seen until now. We can enhance objects at multiple scales. Here you can see how we enhance the core scales of the model. Here it's fine scales. And here all scales at the same time using a combination of sigma values. This multi-scale enhancement is enabled for arbitrary materials using our technique. Here we use the diffuse term to enhance core scales. Here we use the specular term to enhance fine scales. And here we combine this enhancement in one rendering. Here is an example using a transmissive material, where we use the coarse scales to enhance the highlights, fine scales to enhance refractions, and finally combining the results. It's important to note that our technique is general enough to be used in any rendering pipeline. Here we show a global illumination result that we obtained using a pass tracer. Our technique also achieves temporal coherence, as you can see on this video. Here we use the core scales to enhance the highlights and the fine scales to enhance refractions. Here we do the opposite by enhancing fine scales using the specular component and core scales using the transmitted term. In this video, we use the specular term to enhance the small details of the model and the diffuse term to enhance the core scales. Finally, we would like to compare with previous work in a more objective way than just using qualitative comparisons. To that end, we designed the congruent score S. The score is what you see on the bottom row here. It is mapped on the model using a color map ranging from red for a score of 0 to blue for a score of 1. The highest the score, the better. 
This score represents how well depicted the shape is in the rendered image. To compute it, we use the directions and the magnitudes of the shading and shape flows. To obtain a good score, flows must be well aligned and their magnitudes should be comparable. Here you can see that all the methods perform quite well. It is easily explained. Indeed, the scene being well lit and already, the shape is visible almost everywhere. On this plot, you can see our score S computed using different directions of light on the x-axis for different techniques. Our technique is displayed in blue, exaggerated shading is displayed in orange, and the original shading is displayed in red. Notice that local light alignment outperforms most of the previous work techniques, with the exception of exaggerated shading in some cases, particularly at light number 7. With light number 7, we obtain the renderings that you see on the left column here. You see that this lighting introduces a lot of masking. Masking is a phenomenon that makes it difficult to recover shape information because it's either too dark or in the shadow. It's what you can see here. Our method successfully reintroduces shape information, but still not everywhere, like here for instance. While exaggerated shading, using an alpha inversion shading function, does not suffer from masking at all. That's why their score is that stable. So we could say it's both their strength and their weakness, as they are impairing the look of the scene at the price of a shape that is well depicted everywhere, revealing all details of the surface. It's also important to note that our score is far from perfect. It actually does not measure how exaggerated the result is and the coherence with the original aspect of the scene. So we believe that there is an avenue of future work in this direction to find the proper way to measure how good the depiction of shape is in rendered images. What you see here is the first attempt to achieve this goal. We also would like to investigate the amount of exaggeration that is tolerated by the human visual system. Indeed, when pushing sigmas to high values, the exaggeration becomes really strong. It leads to interesting expressive results, as you can see on this crocodile here, giving a tune-like aspect to the renderings. But even though it can be the desired effect, while well, exploring the range of sigma values that lead to plausible results proves to be interesting. It could then be used to guide an automatic enhancement process, for instance. This concludes our talk for today, and I believe that it's also the last presentation of Eurographics 2021. So thank you for your attention, I hope you had a great time. And if you're curious about the method, you can find a small demo on Shadow Toy at this link. If you have any question, feel free to ask. Thank you.